Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Christensen. I'm the director of the Office of Sustainability for the University of Iowa. And I've been in my position for about uh, 16 months, 15, 16 months, something like that. And uh, I hope you've been enjoying our 40th anniversary of Earth Day and all the activities we've been having on campus and in the community as well. Um, Iowa City, I think, has a strong environmental ethic here, and people are very interested and concerned about what we're doing to improve the quality of life in Iowa, and specifically Iowa City, and on our campus. I'm going to talk about the University of Iowa's commitment to sustainability. Uh, that is what the, the president of uh, the university has uh, committed our institution to and the progress we've, we've made so far and some of the challenges that are, are facing us. Um, in uh, February 2008, Governor Culver uh, signed Executive Order 6. Now, prior to coming to the University of Iowa, I worked at the Department of Natural Resources. I was a deputy director there. And uh, I was working in state government when, President, or when Governor Culver signed this executive order. And, and anyone can get online and read the executive orders. It's really um, a directive. Uh, if you will, to executive branch departments that, that says you will do this. And Governor Culver said uh, we're going to start improving our environmental performance in our executive branch departments. We're going to commit to clean and diversified energy sources and we're going to improve our overall performance. And he asked the Board of Regents institutions to join him in this effort. And then on Earth Day two years ago, President Sally Mason announced a strengthened emphasis on sustainability. And I encourage you to get on her website and read her message uh, to the university. Uh, it's a wonderfully visionary statement, and it's a real challenge that she issued to the faculty, the staff, and I consider a, a challenge to the students as well. And she said, we're going to start out with making energy and uh, uh, a real concern of ours. We've been working quite a bit in energy issues for a while, but she really called for working in energy conservation and developing renewables, uh, working on sustainable materials and, life, and taking into consideration life cycle costs of, of items, and that would include looking at the life cycle costs of everything that we purchase, whether it's carpet or wallboard or a piece of equipment or even a building that we build and look at what the, the, that overall uh, life cycle cost is and, and the cost to the environment. Uh, she also said that we needed to work on recycling and improving responsible purchasing. Uh, she made a commitment to building green and environmentally friendly, uh, using environmentally friendly techniques for new construction, as well as reducing the overall carbon footprint of our university-related transportation and travel. That is not as easy as it sounds. That's quite a complicated issue for a university this size, uh, where we have people working on, an, on a national and international level in research, uh, on collaborative uh, leadership in, in many areas. And of course, we have a, a wonderful in, international program, and we encourage students to have an international experience. And so getting a handle on that on uh, reducing the carbon footprint is, is quite a challenge. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Finally, uh, probably the most important work that we do here is integrating sustainability into the academic mission at the University of Iowa and really giving students, young people, all folks who attend uh, the university, the skills and the tools they need to meet these new challenges in what will likely be a carbon-limited world. Further, she, create, she committed to creating a sustainability steering committee, advancing our energy reduction and renewable energy goals uh, from 2013 uh, to 2010, which is this year, uh, creating five interdisciplinary sustainability faculty lines, and actually we're going to create 10 
faculty lines, and those are going to be uh, structured around uh, sustainable water resources, which is appropriate for the University of Iowa when a campus, our campus is bisected by the Iowa River. Uh, she called for planning, especially with students, and bringing students to the table to help us in decision making and, and supporting their efforts in, in wanting to get involved. And that's a big role uh, of our office. And finally, creating the Office of Sustainability. Well, we can't really talk about uh, what we're doing on this campus without an understanding of sustainability. And this is the definition that we use most often, and it comes from the Brundtland Commission report that was issued in the late 1980s. And the Brundtland Commission was convened by the United Nations uh, to look at sustainable development issues across the world. And we begun to recognize that there were limiters to, to quality of life on, on the planet and that these really centered around true economic growth, about equality for all people, access to goods and services, and environmental degradation. And the definition of sustainable development that came out of that report uh, serves to inform our, our work right here and now. And that is sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So what that speaks to is, is taking an intergenerational, a very, very long-term approach to decision-making and thinking not 10 years down the road, not 50 years down the road, but 1,000 years down the road, maybe 30 generations, very, very, very long-term. Here's another definition that I use when I uh, talk to groups, and, and I, I think maybe in some ways it's a little bit more approachable act today without compromising tomorrow. This is the triple bottom line of sustainability. And remember all three of these things, the environment, social inclusion, and economic development really need to come together and work in tandem in order for sustainability to occur and sustainable development to occur. And when you think about it, that really kind of makes common sense, doesn't it? When you have environmental performance, uh, working together with social inclusion, we have really high quality, we have quality of life in our communities and we have strong cultural values intact. And when we have economic development and social inclusion working together, we have people working for a fair wage, a wage in which they can raise a family. Uh, and we have true economic growth. And when we have economic development and environmental performance working together, we can see true economic growth without the degradation of our planet. And all three of those come together to work, to, to make sustainable development happen. And, and that's, I, I always take some time talking about this because I think people think sustainability is simply going green. Well, you know, that's part of it. It's, it's, and that's a very important part of it. Environmental performance is important for us to, to, uh, to achieve. But it also means we need to pay attention to the economic development side and to that social inclusion side. Here's another definition I think that speaks to those other parts of sustainability, and that is enough for everyone forever. And I think this was testimony that was given at the Rio conference. Uh, I think it's very beautiful and it speaks to a fairness. And when we talk about sustainability, sometimes a, a good test for us is, is it fair to other people? Is it fair to the environment? Are we paying a fair price for that good or service? And are, are we paying the real price for that good or service? Well, why should the University of Iowa care about sustainability and really uh, want to get involved in this? Well, this information comes from the National Wildlife Federation and it tells you that, well, indeed, Colleges and universities really should be concerned about sustainability. There are over 4,100 colleges and universities across the United States, and that includes community colleges. They represent about 20 million students and staff, and of that, I think there are, that's about 15 million students included in that number. We spend about $360 billion a year. Uh, of that, about 15 to 18 billion dollars in new construction. So even while the economy may be flagging in some areas, building is still going on in a lot of, on a lot of college and university campuses. 
we spend about $20 billion in operations and energy. And that portion of the pie is getting larger. We represent about 2% of the United States carbon footprint, not an insignificant amount, but we like to say 100% of the higher education footprint. So if anyone's going to be a leader in sustainability, it, it, we should look to our colleges and our universities. The Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education says that there's a, been a dramatic increase in sustainability hires. So, you know, there's one part of the economy that seems to be growing. People, the colleges and universities are, sus are hiring sustainability directors and sustainability coordinators. There are more and more academic programs almost uh, unfolding every day uh, that have sustainability at the core. Uh, colleges and universities are taking energy issues seriously. And it's not just the cost. They're also concerned about this issue of carbon footprint and how they're going to be going to prepare in case we have a, a cap and trade program or a carbon tax. Um, we've seen a significant increase in green building uh, across the United States on campuses. And seriously, it's just almost daily that uh, campuses have uh, green buildings opening. Alternative transportation and green fleets, we're seeing more campuses uh, um, sort of uh, transition their fleets to electric vehicles, to hybrid vehicles, to those that use uh, alternative fuel. Um, sustainable dining, and that includes uh, sourcing locally produced foods, fruits and veg, uh, a, an effort in waste reduction through responsible purchasing and recycling programs, uh, and new recycling programs develop. In, under sustainable de, uh, dining, um, I, I think you can probably go almost campus by campus and see efforts to remove trays from dining halls. Uh, when uh, campuses have done that, they typically see a 15 to 30 percent reduction in food waste. And when you think about it, you know, you carry a tray, you tend to pile stuff on. And unfortunately, a lot of food is wasted. Uh, giving for sustainability has become much more popular to foundations, to university and college foundations. And what I've uh, seen is that giving is, for sustainability is popular at all levels of giving, whether you give $5 a month or whether you write the big check. Givers are concerned that um, their college, their alma mater, is really involved in sustainability. And I think that's really for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I think a donor wants to know that their, the institution that they love is relevant, that they're preparing uh, students for a, a green collar economy or a new way of living, and that the institution itself is interest, wants to be sustainable. That is, the institution wants to be there 500 years from now and, and still be active and vital. And then we've also seen increases in the president's commitment, like President Mason's commitment to sustainability. So the role of my office here on campus is to really work on these kinds of things. Communications, making connections across campus, connecting students with projects that, that can help us be more sustainable, building a culture of sustainability so that we use this we use the principles of sustainability as a framework for decision making, coordinating events. We've been coordinating, obviously, a lot of events this Earth Month, and uh, always keeping the credibility of the university. And that's very important that we be upfront about uh, the challenges that we have, that we share our progress, and that we bring people in and, and to learn about uh, what we're doing. Now, uh, the university has been doing a lot of work, uh, research in sustainability and sustainability-related issues. And this, I, I'm embarrassed to say, this is a, just a, simply a very short list of everything that's going on in the area of, of, of research. Um, but to give you an idea, we have one of the international leaders in climate change analysis here on campus, Jerry Schnorr. He's just uh, a remarkable person who actually was appointed to lead the, um, or who led the uh, Governor's Climate Change Advisory uh, Committee several years ago. 
We're doing the modeling of river flows and working on flood mitigations through the hydroscience uh, lab. We're obviously working on renewable energies, and that work is progressing every single day. We have a wonderful working relationship with the College of Engineering, and they're really helping us look at locally available uh, renewable energy sources. We're working on wind power, and in fact, this, uh, later this spring, we'll, we will be lifting a, a wind turbine on the south part of the campus. Uh, we will let you know when that happens and encourage you to come down and look at it. And of course, we've been working on a biomass project for a number of years. Uh, we have a strong effort uh, in monitoring and controlling and cleaning up air and water pollution and the impacts from that. You know that we have a world-renowned art and writing uh, program and a very strong creative culture here in Iowa City. And as you can imagine, when I first opened the doors of the Office of Sustainability, we had students from engineering, from environmental science, from law, from public policy, international programs want to come and work and be involved in sustainability. But I also was contacted by a playwright, by writers. Uh, we've taken uh, several, a couple of art classes th on tours of the power plant. Um, I, I just find that that's very interesting to make that connection between sustainability and the creative, the creative culture that's here. And those folks wanted to be informed about what's going on and what the challenges are in our, in our world, and they wanted to use that to inspire their creative process. We also have some wonderful work that's going on in planning for livable communities and economies. Um, what comes to mind is the, uh, the work in urban and regional planning. Uh, the field problems class has been going out and working with communities to help them write sustainability plans for communities. And uh, we have some work that's being done by uh, students of Dr. Len Sandler's at the College of Law, uh, I think up in the city of Dubuque. Uh, that, and they're looking at incorporating universal design in, in affordable housing so that people of all abilities can enjoy a quality of life in affordable housing. This is just, uh, just a small, small amount of the research that's going on in sustainability. And I hope to begin to um, sort of uh, bring, bring all of that work together and make that available for people so everyone knows what's going on. It's just remarkable. Well, uh, it, the university has been a member of the Chicago Climate Exchange since 2004. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Chicago Climate Exchange. It's, a, it's an organization, a voluntary organization. It's sort of a precursor to a, uh, a national cap and trade. And so you, are legal, you sign up for it. You're legally obligated to, uh, to reduce your uh, carbon footprint. Uh, and you earn credits, sort of like an actual cap and trade program. And uh, by virtue of our biomass project down at the power plant, we've been able to accumulate some credits uh, through that program. And we are on target to meet our 2010 goal of reducing our carbon footprint by 6%. And we're going to probably renew our, our efforts in Chicago Climate Exchange. We're uh, looking at that right now. But um, uh, with some of the work that's going on, we hope that we can set new and more aggressive goals for reducing our carbon footprint. And we've had a very active Energy uh, Conservation Advisory Council and an uh, Energy Conservation and Management Plan. And all the conservation, Energy Conservation and Management Plan, if you're interested in these kinds of things, I encourage you to get online and read that. It uh, really sets out what we intend to do. Um, Actually, we've um, remember President Mason's commitment to building green and building environmentally friendly. It says nine new buildings, but uh, just recently we'll have 10 new buildings that are uh, either constructed or in the pipeline that are due to achieve at least lead silver uh, in environmental performance. Um, one of those is a major renovation, and that's at uh, the old music building at the corner of Jefferson and Gilbert. And if you've been watching that, that uh, project, it's very, very interesting to take a beautiful building and to renovate it so that it actually meets 
lead silver standards. And I'm so glad the university decided that not to take that building down because I think it's a, it's a wonderful entree into that historic neighborhood and just as a nice transition. And, it, and it's wonderful, I think, to show that, you know, the greenest building is the one that's already built, right? And that you can take something, an older construction, and actually make it in, uh, in improve its environmental performance. Right now, about 11% of our purchased energy comes from renewable sources. I was talking about our biomass project. That's what this is. We've been burning oat hulls, which is a byproduct of the milling process from Quaker Oats uh, for a number of years, I think since 2003. And annually, that displaces about 25,000 tons of coal. And that has really helped to drive down our carbon dioxide uh, emissions from that power plant. And we are continually working on uh, adapting that power plant to, to accommodate more material, more biomass, so that we can uh, transition away from coal and more to more renewable energies. Um, we recently conducted a test burn that included a mix of coal with wood chips. And while we had some, uh, so, some challenges with the, the handling of the material, uh, it performed just fine. So that tells us that, that we can continue our work in this and continue, continue to expand uh, the use of biomass in that power plant. We're also working on, on transitioning the power plant out at Oakdale to 100% renewable. And that will uh, uh, likely include gasification uh, from biomass, uh, perhaps landfill gas uh, from the city of Iowa City landfill and um, and th that's going to be wonderful to have out at the Oakdale campus. Um, we've made renovations in the power plant to really drive to drive efficiencies there and in other areas that that not only uh, save us energy but also save us money. We have a very very strong energy audit program and we do this in partnership with MidAmerica and we are, are able to use the rebates that we get from making energy conservation improvements and saving energy. And that rebate check then, by policy, we turn back into further energy conservation projects. And so the more we save money every year, the more that compounds and helps us drive energy efficiency across campus. And that's a real challenge for this campus because we are a growing campus. We're building buildings. And every time we add space, um, our energy demands uh, increase, and we need to balance that growth in energy demand with energy conservation elsewhere so that we don't have a continuing, continuing upward uh, demand of energy. We're working hard on transportation. We have the largest combined with the, the city of Coralville and with Iowa City. Our CAN bus service, uh, the, those three systems offer the largest public transit system in Iowa. And the CAN bus system is free. It's free to anybody who rides. And that's wonderful. That's a disincentive to bringing your, your car or driving your car around campus. Uh, we offer city bus discounts. We charge for parking. I know it's not popular, but frankly, it's a disincentive to, to bringing a car on campus. Uh, we, have over, we have about 80 van pools operating now that serve close to 800 people. And um, I learned something very interesting the other day. Those van pools actually keep about 9 million passenger miles off the road every year. That's remarkable. That's just, just fantastic. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and as you can tell, we, had a, uh, wonderful, we have active biking culture here on campus, and the students held a, a really fun activity this afternoon, a bike to class event right out here. And they actually had bicycle-powered smoothies. So they, they were biking and running a, uh, a mixer at the same time, so they're making smoothies. Uh, we have new purchasing goals to be more responsible purchasers and sourcing more locally produced materials, goods, and services, um, looking at recycled content and environmentally uh, preferable products. Uh, close to 90% of all the paper that we purchase is, is recycled content. And much of our rough papers that we use are 100% recycled content. Uh, we're working hard on waste reduction and avoiding the production of waste. We have a challenge with recycling. 
and we need to improve our recycling programs. We know that, and we're working on uh, developing a new res uh, sort of a, a redesign of our recycling program on campus, and hopefully increasing our composting. We take pre-consumer food from the Hillcrest and Burge uh, food dine food preparation areas, and I think it's about a, a ton and a half a week that actually is diverted out to the landfill and we produce compost. The city produces compost, I should say, very good compost. And uh, we actually use that compost then back on the student garden to produce more fruit and veg. We feel though our greatest impact is educating this new generation of thinkers and innovators and entrepreneurs. And I, I feel very strongly that the, the, really the, the major work that needs to be done in climate change mitigation in, in addressing the needs of populations across this, the world and building true long-term economic growth is going to fall on the shoulders of the students in school now and who will be entering school in the next 10 years. So we have an obligation to help these students learn about sustainability and gain those problem-solving skills. We're proud to offer an undergraduate certificate in sustainability. We're working to build sustainability into just about every aspect of education across campus and providing uh, real uh, practical application, work application, and mentoring opportunities for students. A question that we get, I get quite often is, you know, do students really care? Well, yes, they do. Students do care. They care tremendously. Uh, most students want to work in a profession that, that has beneficial impact on this environment. And most students want to work for an organization, an institution, a nonprofit, uh, a company that has a beneficial impact on the environment. And I am so happy to say that we have just this wonderful group of, of very active students who are challenging us, who are questioning us, who are active. Um, and without them, we would not have done a, an awful lot of things. Because of student-driven initiatives, we will now have a living learning community on campus focused on sustainability. That's starting this fall. We have a student garden that's, uh, I think, very well run, and that produce is, goes into the Iowa Memorial Union and is used in the catering services there and the food service there. Uh, the IMU is committed to local foods. Uh, uh, Mr. Gear, who's the director of food services at the IMU, wanted to reach 75% of his purchases by dollar uh, uh, to be local foods, but he was, he's at 50% right now, and he's still working on it. Students have developed a bike share proposal. We're working to get grant funding for that. Uh, we have plastics recycling in many places across campus need more plastic recycling across campus, but we did that because of student initiatives. The food composting was a student initiative. The Earth Month activities, many of those came from the work of students. Our Green Summit that we're holding tomorrow morning, organized entirely by students. Um, our film festival um, that have been held uh, across campus. Uh, a weatherization project and Habitat for Humanity humanities project in the College of Business that's uh, working to build green, um, uh, green building techniques in that, in that house and orientation for new students. So we have very active students that are involved in making sure we have policies that support sustainability across campus. And we had a new st a student group start this, this uh, year, which it was wonderful. The uh, Echo Hawks out of the College of Public Health and their tremendous enthusiasm. So, in conclusion, uh, I want to let you know that we, we feel we're a leader in many areas in sustainability, and we will continue to be by supporting and expanding this critical research in sustainability by leading by example through energy conservation and building renewable energy systems and educating, preparing this next generation of students to meet the demands of a, a carbon-limited world. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna
Bolt. Uh... Okay, what I'm going to talk about um, tonight is what the city is doing in, in uh, sustainability initiatives. In my position as environmental coordinator, I've been in this position about nine months. I've been working for the city about two years now, and the position came up as environmental coordinator, and it's one of only three three cities in the state of Iowa that have a position um, that, that has duties like mine. There's a sustainability coordinator in Dubuque and one in Fairfield, and uh, we collaborate often about the same sorts of projects. So uh, I feel really grateful that uh, as a citizen that uh, we have a position like this, and uh, I also am very grateful to have uh, such a great job. So why are city governments concerned about sustainability? I'm gonna go over that. I'm gonna talk about what Iowa City is doing. And then also, what really makes a city sustainable and how can that really be measured? I know a lot of, it's kind of a buzzword, a lot of people are talking about uh, green cities that are being ranked, and um, I'll just touch a little bit about that at the end. So why are city governments concerned about sustainability? Here's the, here's, uh, the diagram that you're used to. Um, and I'm with Liz, everybody understands the environmental green part. Um, I think with the economy having um, the issues that we have lately, everybody's really getting on board with the uh, economic part. But really the reason for it all is for the people. For the environmental part, we really want to breathe clean air, have clean water uh, for the people. And we want to have, as a community, good uh, quality of life. And so even though my title is environmental coordinator, it seems like I'm really trying to push um, the other two circles as well, because I think that um, as a city, we're doing a lot of environmental projects, and I think that it's time that we tie them all together because um, we ha we do we have a lot of uh, programs in every in all of those three circles. Um, one thing about our country is that we're very urbanized, and one reason that it's important for cities to focus on. Um, sustainability is 81% of our populations in this country live in urban areas. So if we can, if we can get our cities to be sustainable, um, we've covered 80, 80, 81% of it. And worldwide, 49% um, of, of uh, the population lives in cities. So uh, we're more urbanized than a lot of uh, countries are. Uh, this is a list of different uh, city government uh, programs, and this is, uh, you can see it's a perfect, we're in a perfect situation to look at sustainability because uh, not only do we have environmental um, of, uh, tasks to do with transportation, solid waste, we were in the landfill, um, we, we have the water plant, the wastewater plant, um, and we also deal with um, the community. We have neighborhood associations, we have uh, economic development. So we really cover all three aspects of the, of the circles that I just showed you. But part of having a sustainability r really depends on a lot of other people besides the city government. So um, as a city, as we become more sustainable, we're also very dependent on, on University of Iowa since they're such a large part of our community. Also businesses and industries and nonprofits, um, external partners working with the states. Uh, with the state programs and also with the public. So all of these are very uh, important links and partnerships to uh, have a sustainable community. So what other, what other uh, places around the country are working on sus sustainability issues? All over the country, all sorts of cities, just Google anything and you can come up with different cities across uh, the United States that are working on sustainability issues. So it's a really hot topic and we want to stay, um, we want to sort of keep up with the Joneses because it's, my screen just went blank. This, this happens with this computer sometimes too, doesn't it? Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a good place to be to keep, to keep on board with that. Um, with the economic crisis, we haven't really felt it as bad in Iowa, but um, I heard a talk from somebody from uh, Michigan and they've really felt it there and it's really given them uh, having a sustainability plan has really kept them um, uh, on task and, and put them in a, at an advantage. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Green Cities Report. It was published um, last year, um, but they've surveyed 40 of the most um, populated cities in, in the country, and four of five cities report that sustainability is among one of their top priorities, and 75% of those cities are creating have just finished or have a sustainability plan. So it's very, um, very uh, pressing thing for all cities around the country. 
So what is Iowa City doing? We started um, down a road when the mayor signed the mayor's climate protection agreement in 2007. Some citizens went to the mayor and um, approached the mayor and asked for him to sign that. It was Russ Wilburn at the time, which he agreed to. And um, that is, there's many cities across the country that have signed that, and it's really become a, a real um, a beginning point for a lot of cities. And cities in general, as far as climate protection, have done a lot of work around the country. Um, as a result of, of that signage, we joined ICLE, which is an organization called Local Governments for Sustainability, which I'll talk a little bit um, more about in a second. And uh, as a part of the ICLE program they're in, we're, we completed our community-wide greenhouse gas inventory, uh, just finished that in August last year. So what ICLE is, it's an international organization. There's over 600 members in the U.S., and they assist local governments with completing their greenhouse gas inventory, helping them finish climate action plans after they've done that, and then also helping them with sustainability um, plans. And so what's nice about ICLE is you don't have to become a member of ICLE, but they help you, um, guide you along the process, and especially with the greenhouse gas inventory, they, preside, they, they, they help um, cities have consistency across the nation so that when you're comparing Boulder to Iowa City to Chicago, that you're looking at the same things. And um, having done the greenhouse gas inventory, um, I can tell you it was really nice to, to um, have the software, know what data you had to collect, uh, plug it in, and also look at different cities and how, you know, how somebody else's transit uh, system compared to ours. So um, it was, I think it's very useful um, organization for us to belong to. So with ICLE, there's 200 um, cities across the U.S. that have completed their greenhouse gas inventories now. Iowa City is the first city in Iowa to have um, uh, completed our greenhouse gas inventory. It's available on our city website or you can also find it on the Eco Iowa City website um, through the library. Uh, 155 cities have adopted greenhouse gas reduction targets. 121 have climate action plans, and 60 have sustainability plans through, through ICLE, through this organization. Um, we're not the only members of ICLE in Iowa. This is a list of um, other cities, and these other cities are all working on their greenhouse gas inventories. And uh, Johnson County has finished their Johnson County uh, Government Operations Greenhouse Gas Inventory, and they're the only um, county in Iowa that's an ICLE member. So in finishing our greenhouse gas inventory, we now have a baseline to uh, judge where we go to from now. We can keep track of um, where, where we were at, at the year 2000, and we can keep track of our reductions um, from there. So this, these are the results from the 2000 um, data, and you can see um, it's divided into different sections, um, residential, commercial. It includes the University of Iowa power plant, um, industry, waste, and transportation. So um, what this includes is all of the energy use, and also wastewater uh, treatment, and landfill gas methane for our population uh, within our city limits. So if your house is within the city limits, you're included in residential. It includes all the natural gas and electricity used within the city, um, transportation on all of our streets and, ro and roads as well. So all of, the, all of the greenhouse gas emissions within our city limits. And you can see our baseline emissions there is 1.3 million metric tons, uh, which is about average per capita for the U.S. Average per capita for the U.S. is about 22 metric tons, and ours is about 21 metric tons uh, per capita. We also looked at 2008 for those same sector, sectors, and you can see we increased in most categories except for two. One is the University of Iowa power plant, and you can see uh, most of that's a result from their burning the oat holes. And it turns out 2008 was a really bad year to look at, um, at for our second year because of the flood. And um, the, I know the University of, of Iowa power plant was offline partially, so some of that might be reflected in that, but for the most part they helped by sharing their data, and I could see that it was um, uh, decreasing through time. So um, a lot of that's real data. The other decrease was because of uh, waste, and that's from methane reduction at the landfill, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So part of the inventory, they um, suggest that you do a forecast of your growth for your community, 
And um, I did that through 2050. And then also uh, to predict an 80% reduction, what is the, which is the, what the federal government, the state government, and ICLE is recommending. So you can see that's a pretty shocking graph of how much we need to reduce by 2050. And um, I think you can see that that's probably not going to be done unless we start using renewable energy. So I'm, that we can't do that by changing our light bulbs or having conservation. It has to come from um, other technologies. And it's not that energy is bad. We're always going to use energy. We're, we're going to continue to grow, grow as a city. But um, we need to find some alternative methods uh, to, to get our energy. So as a part of the greenhouse gas inventory, we also looked at our city government operations. And this is our totals for the year 2000. You can see our landfill um, methane gas was 73% of our total in, in the year 2000. Uh, a lot of cities don't own and operate the landfill. Uh, the, one of the reasons this is so big is that we had to include, since we own and operated all the emissions, which includes all of the waste from the entire county, which is twice the population of the city. So um, it sort of skews our totals a little bit, but we are responsible um, for it as emissions. And as you know, methane gas is 21 times more potent than CO2. So um, our landfill is, is um, in 2000, our, by far our largest um, producer of, of, of um, greenhouse gas inventory, of greenhouse gas emissions, sorry. So what have we done since um, 2000? I'll, t I'll tell you a few, few of our programs that we were, have been working on since then, and uh, then we'll look at, at our emissions for 2008. Um, of course, we've done the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, we've created a position uh, such as mine to coordinate our efforts. Um, we've had energy audits on all of our major facilities. Um, I've been working on that. We've been working with Mid-America, um, Mid-American Energy um, on that. Um, we also have been working on our methane um, project with U of I and hoping to um, create a system that they can use our methane gas to, to um, use as energy for Oakdale. Um, we have an Eco Iowa City grant that maybe you've gone, gone to some of those programs that they've been having with the community. Um, we've got some stimulus funny, funding to work on energy efficiency. Um, we're using that for our own buildings and also um, we're going to have a revolving loan program to loan money for um, energy efficiency projects within the community. Um, we have been focusing on lead building when we build. Um, we've been working on, with others on having a green business certification that's in the works. Um, we got a grant for a sustainable communities, um, a grant. We're one of five in the whole country for the new riverfront crossing area that's down by the flooded area by City Carton. Uh, we have numerous recycling programs. We have that great compost that everybody raves about. Uh, we have um, many bike trails. We, I think we're four times, uh, our bike use is four times uh, what it is in the rest of the state. We've done many prairie and wetland restorations and have a lot of natural areas. We have over 800 acres of uh, prairie, wetland, and forested areas. Um, I'm a part of the sustainability coordinators networking across the country. Um, and we use methane in our digesters at the wastewater treatment plant. We use the methane that's produced um, to heat the digesters and, and recycle it. And we also are trying to promote local foods. And there's many other things too. This is actually um, not everything. Um, we, since 2000, we've uh, replaced all of our traffic signals with LED tra traffic um, lights. Um, this is a huge reduction of energy. Uh, this is our LEED certified fire station on Emerald Street uh, that has geothermal. Uh, we use biodiesel in our buses in our fleet. Um, we started with 2% and now we use 10% in our buses and 5% in the rest of our fleet. Um, we have plans for a uh, LEED certified environmental education center at our east side recycling that's going to be on Scott Boulevard out by Fairway. Uh, and this is the business uh, sustainability certification that we're working on that we hope is, uh, uh, hope happens within our city and it actually would be in six different counties. 
Um, we just got a grant to, to put uh, LED lighting in our, in our Court Street parking ramp, and we also got some more funding to do our other lighting in our, um, all the rest of our parking ramps. So that's going to um, be very energy efficient and save quite a bit of money. Um, with our energy audits, we've identified um, uh, energy savings of, I think it's going to be at least over $150,000 a year, and with our uh, parking ramps, I think it's going to be over $60,000 a year for those. So in 2001, we, ca we started capturing and flaring our landfill. It was EPA regulated because of our size. Um, this is, uh, um, you can see here, that's one of the uh, wells, and then the if you've ever been to the landfill, which I hope you have been, um, it, this is our flare system here. So instead of just letting it emit, we actually capture it and burn it so it it's, um, creates less, it turns into CO2 so the emissions are quite less. So for 2008, um, this is our governmental uh, greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that the uh, solid waste has reduced significantly since then. And our hope is that with with the university using it, um, it'll even become more um, efficient instead of just flaring it, it can actually be useful to heat and uh, heat buildings. Uh, another interesting thing to notice is that if you combine our water delivery services from our, uh, the energy used at the water plant and the wastewater plant, um, that's like 30% of our energy for the city. So just to, to get water from the ground, treat it, send it to everybody's houses, businesses, industry, um, send it to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, treat it and send it back to the river is uh, very energy, um, it's, it, it takes a lot of energy. So anything that, that we can do with conserving water conserves the city um, energy. Um, in 2000, the government emissions were 9% of the community. Uh, the community total in 2008, we reduced it to four because of the capturing and flooring of the methane. So the point is, even if the city government made everything um, happen, so we reduced our emissions to zero, it would only be 4% of the total community. So 96% is, is everything else. So you can see that we need, uh, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do it together. So um, after finishing the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, these are the, the ICLE five milestones. So we've completed our baseline emissions inventory. Uh, if you look at the ICLE website, it's checked off. We've completed milestone one. Um, and, and you can see that we're the only city in Iowa that has done that so far. So our choice is to do either a climate action plan or a sustainability plan. If we choose to do a climate action plan, um, we need to meet a, figure out um, what our reduction target's going to be, like 20% by 2020 or some percentage by a certain year. And um, then we need to write a plan um, how we're going to get there and implement the plan and then monitor and verify emissions after that. So, um, and as you can see, and, and remember, 96% is everybody else. So it's going to be working with businesses, industry, the university, um, and the public. So our other choice is to do a sustainability plan. Um, which would include a climate action plan too, but this would be a broader plan that would involve um, the social and uh, the economic aspects in town as well. Um, I think it's a broader plan that would tie everything together. Uh, we don't have the first milestone for this completed yet, but one of the steps is to complete a greenhouse gas inventory. So there, there's other things that we would need to assess first too, but you can see the milestones are very similar. Uh, we need to set goals, uh, develop a plan, and uh, implement it and monitor it. So um, one of those will be um, what we do in the future. Uh, the typical elements of a sustainability plan are listed here. Um, there's a lot of a lot of cities are going this way, and um, ICLE has a lot of uh, help and toolkits on how to how to do this. Um, uh, the process would be the same. We'd need to involve the public, the community, uh, local experts, businesses, industry, whether we do a climate action plan or a sustainability plan. 
So the question is, with all these cities becoming sustainable and green and all this, I mean, it's, you know, we don't want to do something that's just talk, or talk and just labeled. And um, you know, how is that really measured? I mean, how can we compare what we're doing uh, compared to Chicago or Minneapolis? And, and how do we know that we're on the right track? Well, um, ICLEI hopes to have something called the Star Community Index, that they um, want to be a national voluntary program they, that they have standardized, and there's certain metrics, measurable metrics, that they measure all cities for. Of course, depending on what um, different services they um, supply, um, it would be a rating system very similar to LEED, and you get points for certain things, and there would be an independent third-party verification. So, um, you know, we could go around saying, you know, we're sustainable, um, all we want, but you know, we really need measurable, real metrics to measure that and um, to know where our strengths and, and where, we, where we could have improvement. So if they, um, uh, so, I'm sorry, um, so with this community index, uh, it would be really flexible with population size. You know, something for, um, you know, Fairfield might be really different than for uh, Des Moines because um, they're very different in their services they pro provide, also with location, because different locations, um, you know, Arizona is quite different than, than us. We're going to use more natural gas for, um, for uh, heating, for example. But this isn't available yet. It's, it's, um, hope, they're hoping to roll it out uh, next year. So we're kind of uh, wanting to not only do um, make our efforts sustainable, but make sure that it's that it's real, that it's, that it's true and that it's real. So that's all I have.